Hey, what's up? This is Amanda Kiernan from Into Eternity and the Order of Chaos. Hey guys, this is Stu from Death Dealer. This is Vicky Sarakis from The Agonist. Hey, this is Tim Ripper Owens. Hi, this is Charlotte from The Lane, and you are listening to The Great Metal Debate Podcast. Welcome, Great Metal Debate listeners, to another of our artist interviews, where we bring you some of the most talented, compelling, and cutting-edge musicians in metal. Today, I am very excited to be joined by Ida Hawkland, bassist and vocalist for the metal band Triosphere. Ida, welcome to the Great Metal Debate podcast. Thank you so much. For those who aren't familiar with Triosphere or maybe have just heard about them, can you provide our listeners with a brief background on the band, perhaps where you're from, and how the band got started. Yeah, sure. Uh, Well, first of all, we are from Norway. Uh, We live in the right in the middle of Norway and we started up in late 2004, actually. Um, It was me and uh, songwriter um, Marius Silver, the guitarist. Uh, And then we were uh, quickly uh, a full lineup. Uh, We released our debut album Onwards uh, in 2006 in Norway in 2007 uh, the rest of the world and we followed up with our second album The Road Less Traveled in 2010 and now we have our third album out The Heart of the Matter which was released in the US on the 2nd of December last year uh, so that's a very short sum up of um, of our history. Uh, I might also add that we have uh, been so lucky to do um, six European tours uh, throughout the years with uh, bands which uh, we really look up to, and that's bands such as Sonata Artica, uh, Arch Enemy. Uh, everything actually started with Wasp and touring with them, both in Norway and Europe. Um, we've done... Uh, a few cool festivals but to this date we have only done one performance outside of Europe and that was at the 70,000 tons of metal that went from Florida to Fort Lauderdale uh, sorry from from Fort Lauderdale to Jamaica uh, this January mm-hmm. so uh we uh that's that's the next goal for the band to to what shall i say expand our territory and uh and try to be uh, come out more live in uh, both uh, North and South America and Asia. And, yeah, we're we definitely we are hoping and trying to all come out of Europe as well. Sounds like some exciting stuff on the horizon for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, stylistically, for folks who might have some uh, assumptions about bands from Norway or the Scandinavian <laughs> countries, might be thinking more the you know the. Black metal. Can you give us a little uh, idea what stylistically fans can expect when they hear the music of Triosphere? Yeah. Uh, well, it's it's uh, it's no surprise that uh, that black metal and extreme metal is uh, one of the biggest musical um, assets of Norway, actually. So uh, we've uh, we've on a regular basis uh, heard that. Okay, you're from Norway. Don't you play black metal? No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, we uh, uh, hmm. uh, in the jungle of genres. It's uh, it's a bit difficult to uh, to say exactly what kind of metal we're playing, but I usually just say melodic heavy metal. Um, yes. We have um, uh, we have been labeled as progressive metal, as power metal, even as thrash metal. <laughs> And everything between, but but most often I see that they, uh, the um, uh, the journalists and the, the the general feedback from listeners are that we are some kind of a progressive power metal band. Um, but uh, we are not caught up in uh, in playing up specific kind of of metal. I think maybe that's why uh, it it seems like. Uh, people have had the, a bit difficulties with placing us within just one uh, limited kind of, of expression. Um, we are influenced by lots of hard rock from the 80s and, and 70s and, um, of course, modern rock and metal as well. Uh, we have influences from, of course, the black metal scene. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but all kinds of, of music. Uh, we just 
think that good music is good music, and we we are influenced and inspired by uh, all kinds of expressions. So, the easy answer: melodic heavy metal. <laughs> I think that's a great description, and uh, you had alluded before to touring with some bands in Europe like Arch Enemy, and uh, I know you've toured with Camelot as yes, well. Yes. You talked about Wasp, and all those bands uh, may be coming from different subgenres, but they all have that melodic approach as, as part of their music. Yes, absolutely, and that was something that we uh, we talked about when we um, uh, when we got the message that we could go out on, on a, a small tour with Arch Enemy because, of course, they are a much more heavy band than us uh, and the vocal expression, at least, is really places them in, in a different uh, expression. Uh, but we thought, uh, okay, but they have a very, very strong presence of melody in uh, all their music and so have we, so hopefully their fans will also like us, <laughs> even though we are softer around the edges you might say and um, we've always been very good uh, very well received by uh, the the fans of all the bands that we've been out on tour with so we are very grateful for that and we'd like to think that that means that we have a very um, um, uh, accessible sound <laughs> absolutely that has to feel good when when you do go out with bands that aren't aren't exactly your type of music, mm. but the fans still respond positively. For sure. Absolutely. <laughs> well, let me ask you about your most recent album, that the Heart of the Matter album, released uh, a little over six months ago. Now that you've had a little distance and been able to perform some of the songs live, how, how do you all evaluate the album with that distance now? Um, well, we were very proud of it when we were, if we were mixing it, mixing it uh, and also when we were, we were re releasing it so we kind of we've um we kind of had a, a healthy distance to the material all along so it wasn't like that we were really fed up with it you might say when it was released we were uh, we still listened a lot to it then and we still do uh, but of course now that it's been out there a while i well, I like it even more. <laughs> um, I am, I'm very, yeah, well, uh, that's a bit the reason why we use as long time as we do to put out an album because we, we craft the songs until they are all that we want them to be. So it's, of course, very, it's a good feeling to listen to the songs on the album uh, several months after it's released and still feel that, yeah, we, uh, th this was, this came out the way we wanted. We're still, it still feels really good, and the feedback has been completely mind blowing. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, yeah. And I want to ask you about that. Uh, we we had our list of top ten metal albums for 2014 for our podcast uh, back in December. I hadn't yet heard your new album, and I definitely would have found a place on the list if I had. The reviews have been really great for the album, and I I wonder how that receiving that positive feedback has motivated the band? Um, it definitely gives a huge boost in motivation and, um, uh, and an inspiration, you might say, as well. Um, it's, um, um, you can, we, we never take for granted uh, any good feedback that we, that we receive. We're always so grateful. It's always such a huge pleasure to, to see people who think the album is is good and or great or inspiring or, or whatever. Um, so of course you uh, you spend so much time working on material, uh, and especially us. <laughs> I've understood, um, and um, we it's it's a very very personal part of yourself. So uh, when you put it out there and you get that kind of feedback, uh, it's. Um, Yes, it's definitely a, a huge, huge motivation, and um, uh, well, so so grateful to uh, to get the chance to to both reach out to so many people and to also um, receive that kind of feedback. So um, it's, it's a bit difficult to answer any more than that, but yes, it's motiva motivating and a very grateful experience. It is obvious you all put a lot of time and effort into the writing and composing process. I wonder if you could give our listeners a little insight into what that process is like from the germ that becomes a song mm. through the point that you have the finished product. Mm. Uh, it's um, 
I would dare say that no song is made exactly like the next one. Um, it, so, um, and maybe I should start with the first and foremost. Uh, Marius, the guitarist, is the one who writes all the music uh, mainly, um, and sometimes he has uh, almost the whole arrangement of a song ready before he presents it to the rest of us, and then we. Well, uh, we start working a bit together uh, at the rehearsal room. Um, we tweak and test out different kind of uh, rhythm patterns, uh, at least uh, as far as me and the drummer are concerned. Um, other times we uh, try different kind of keys in the different parts. We maybe change parts and so on and so forth. Uh, other times he perhaps only have one or two parts of a song and then we start just jamming out to see what happens. Um, all that being said, I do all the vocal melodies and all the lyrics and sometimes those melodies comes first and then I and Morris sit together and, and work something out um, from that angle. Uh, is always um, a product of um, uh, the entire band uh, because all the songs are worked uh, on in the rehearsal room together with uh, all four of us. So, um, um, yeah, I think that's... Uh, and, <laughs> and Ida, your part is, is maybe a little greater as you're both playing the bass guitar and singing. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder how that plays into it, that you're both performing with an instrument and doing the vocals. Yeah. Um, um, on the on, on our second album, uh, The Road Less Traveled, we were playing the songs a lot more in the rehearsal room before we um, b before I started working on the vocal lines and before we entered the studio. So um, uh, it was um, that kind of came. What shall I say? Simultaneously, I was kind of working on both the vocal lines and the bass line at the same time. Um, on this last album, I, uh, we kind of had all the music done before I actually started to work on the vocal lines. Uh, so uh, I was doing all these melodies without playing the bass at the same time. So when I, after the, uh, the album was recorded <laughs> and we were going to start rehearsing in everything to perform it live, I realized that, oh, okay, I have some extra work to do here to be able to synchronize what I'm doing <laughs> with my vocals sure. and the hands. <laughs> But um, but it's uh, it, it all fits. It's just about rehearsing a bit together and um, uh, well, it, I've always worked like that. I always uh, had an instrument and and the voice. So um, yeah. You you find that helpful actually to to be doing both those things? Yeah yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, uh, especially when uh, when I perform. What well, maybe it's more or less because I've always sung and played an instrument at the same time. But I am. Uh, what shall I say? It's um, it. I find it both um, in, as an inspiration and actually as a, a almost physical support <laughs> to have the <laughs> bass at the same time as I'm playing. Uh, I've been used to that. So it's all about how I'm how I'm standing and how where I'm placing uh, the weight and everything when I'm singing. I'm I'm used to have have that goddamn heavy bass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not the same it's, time. it's part of your performance now. It, I would actually, yeah, uh, I would say it's, uh, it's pretty much part of it. <laughs> so it's always, always a bit, um, takes a bit adjustment for me when I'm in the studio, when I'm only singing to, uh, to find the, the proper way to, to stand <laughs> and place myself to, um, to perform, you might say. A bit exaggerated, but you get my point. <laughs> sure. Talking about vocals and vocalists. We, we talked earlier about Arch Enemy, which obviously has a, a very different sort of vocal approach, and then there are yeah. other bands like a Nightwish, which, which does something different uh, than, than what you're doing. What sort of singers have inspired or influenced your performance? Uh, that is uh, actually without a doubt David Coverdale and Ronnie James Dio. Um, I started, I was only a backing singer uh, until I was around 20 years old, and then I started doing the lead vocals for a uh, 80s hard rock cover band. Uh, and uh, actually, it's it's a bit embarrassing to say, but that was it's what's not really until then that I really got to know the 
all the good stuff that you have in the 80s hard rock scene. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but at least uh, I really, I completely fell in love with uh, the voice of, uh, of Coverdale and Dio, and uh, we sang a lot of songs um, uh, of them. And, and I think the, um, um, the reason is much the uh, ability to um, perform and convey the emotion and the sincerity in um, uh, in in the music and in the lyrics. Of course, when you're talking about White Snake, it's uh, the lyrics are a bit like so and such <laughs> from from, uh, from, uh, from some albums. Uh, but but anyways, it's 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 a passion and a sincerity in both Coverdale and um, Dio's voice that always been so inspiring for me and. Uh, and I love the, uh, the the melody lines, so uh, uh, so absolutely they are uh, in the, in the very top of my inspirations. Two great singers, no doubt. Yeah. You referenced earlier the uh, seventy thousand tons of metal cruise you participated in on January. I wanted to ask you what that experience was like, and particularly, did you see any other bands that impressed you? Uh, well, first of all, it was a uh, uh, what should I say? It's it was a extraordinary experience <laughs> to be on that cruise, for sure. Uh, just the cruise itself and and that whole part of it was uh, was just outstanding. And um, uh, and then the festival, all the bands, the lineup was also uh, just fantastic. It was so many bands that you really have, at least uh, on my behalf I could not reach over half of all I wanted to see uh, but a lot of good bands a really good um, everything was organized really well I think um, and uh, I loved the Pretty Maids uh, performance oh. um, uh, of course Arch Enemy was really cool uh, oh I have to think back now um, if I'm right, you've opened for Arch Enemy with both Alisa and Angela. Yes, that's true. Uh, we did. Uh, we opened for Arch Enemy in 2009 and 2010, uh, and then we did two gigs with them in Norway in uh, last year with uh, Alisa. So yeah, we've been around with both, and uh, uh, yeah, that that should also also be added. Angela has been uh, a huge inspiration as well because her stage presence is just insane. <laughs> so um, so that was uh, that has been a, a really cool experience. But uh, Alyssa is also she she just um, yeah she she takes that stage like it's nobody's business. <laughs> So um so I, and it seems like uh, Arch Enemy has really managed to pull off that switch uh without seemingly uh, being um weakened by it at all. It seems like they are really on top of their game as far as I can see. Um but yeah, I I want to mention that from the from the cruise. Uh one band that was uh really awesome was actually Annihilator. Oh, the Canadian band. Yes. yes. They were uh they were they they play a really cool set. And it was really cool also because uh, our drummer is an insanely diehard Annihilator fan and he's never seen them live before so he was completely uh, over the roof <laughs> in excitement. <laughs> so uh, now it was a fantastic experience the whole thing. Absolutely. Beginning to wrap up with you Edith. What can people expect from Triosphere over the remainder of 2015 and beyond, if you have any plans beyond that? Well, uh, we have been saying all along, and we will keep on saying that we are working on getting out on a tour. And uh, also, like I started with saying, we definitely are trying to, to get more out of Europe uh, as well, because we... Uh, we see now that we are starting to establish at least some listeners <laughs> around in North and South America uh, and, and, and actually around India as well. So we really hope to reach more out in, the, in those territories. Um, as of right now, we don't have anything confirmed. Uh, it's, um, it's a tougher and tougher business for each year out there. The more bands are trying to get out on, uh, on tours, it's... Um, it's it's not easy so but we're doing our very best but for 2015 uh we are uh we have done one norwegian festival so far and we have four more to go in uh, the 19th and 20th of june in halden in norway the tons of rock festival 
the next one is um, let me see now. Uh, it's the we have one the 12th of September uh, in Christian Sun, which is called Southern Discomfort. Uh, and we are actually going out on a boat again <laughs> uh, on, um, uh, from, that goes from Norway down Alsta over to Denmark, uh, which is called Rock the Boat. And that is the, if I remember correctly now, I think it's the 30th of August. Hope that was correct. <laughs> uh, and then there is uh, one more also in, um, in around 9th of August, uh, in, uh, East, southeast or Norway. There will be some chances in Norway this year, at least. I suppose folks should just keep watching the internet and uh, keeping an eye out for potential other dates elsewhere in the world. Absolutely, because we know all the other tours we have gone out on, uh, or maybe not all of them, but several of them, the, the offers have popped up with not a very much uh, time ahead of the actual dates. So things might still happen. <laughs> so we are definitely uh, working on it. Uh, we have no intention of just sitting at home <laughs> with the album out. We want to come out and play. That's why we're in this. So just keep an eye out. Well, as people are doing that, how can they find out more about Triosphere, including how to purchase your music and merchandise? Yeah. Well, uh, we uh, are fairly good at updating uh, our Facebook site. Uh, it's, of course, uh, facebook.com slash Uh We are trying to become better at updating our uh, official website, which is thetriosphere.com. Uh, but, well, it's, uh, Facebook is very accessible for everyone, so we, we are at least you can find almost all info you need there about dates and festivals and what's happening and everything. Um, when it comes to our music, it should be available on uh, well all the the big uh, music merchandise sites like Amazon.com, CDON.com. Uh, of course, from uh, our label AFM Records own website, also possible to purchase the um, the album. Uh, also, streaming services uh, like Spotify and Wimp. Uh, do have uh, at least our newest album available. Spotify should have all of them. Uh, when it comes to other kind of merchandise, we are kind of in limbo on that right now, <laughs> uh, because we are um, we have been trying to handle it ourselves, but we are uh, are trying to um, to find a company to uh, to sell it on our behalf because it's kind of we don't have a really good system within the band for it and. So it's mainly coming to our concerts to get T-shirts and hoodies as of right now. But we are working on getting a good system up there so we can... Uh, um, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, se sell uh, the merch all around the world and send it around. So maybe the best way to support the band, keep looking out for some tour dates upcoming and come out, watch you all live, and then buy the music right there. For sure. We always bring CDs and the merchandise to all our shows. And of course, now for the next shows, at least in Norway, of course, we will be having new merchandise also. Well, I can't encourage our listeners enough to check out Triosphere and in particular, this new album, The Heart of the Matter. Fans of any type of melodic metal will find something to like here, I assure them. Ida, thank you so much for joining us today. I I really hope someday in the near future I'm fortunate enough to see Triosphere perform live and maybe get you to autograph my copy of your album. Oh, awesome. Uh, thank you so very much yourself for, uh, for actually do, taking time to, to have us on your podcast. This is uh, obviously the, one of the most valuable things we can have that people actually want to talk to us and, and then um, promote us to their listeners again. So thank you so much.